When we look at other groups, um, their experience with World War II is a little bit more positive overall. Native Americans, like Mexican Americans, were not segregated in the armed forces, and many of them chose to enlist uh, to show their patriotism, their place in American society, and for more opportunities. In particular, uh, the armed forces start a program called the Navajo Code Talkers, which remained top secret until the 1970s. Navajo Code Talkers uh, were basically a group specifically chosen because of their indigenous language. So one of the big concerns in any military conflict is making sure that your communication is secure and encrypted. And the U.S. military really knew that whatever code that they invented uh, for communications would be more secure if they could communicate in a language that was not likely to be understood by outsiders. And so this is where the U.S. Uh, starts to look at indigenous languages or native languages in the United States for a potential for use in this coded communication. The Navajo language is chosen for this program in part because it is exceedingly difficult to learn uh, if you are not uh, raised as a native speaker. Uh, there are some words in which there are many different uh, ways of saying that word. So, for example, in English, we have one general word for black, uh, and in Navajo, there are many more words uh, for that same color that could be used. And so they start recruiting on Navajo reservations for these code talkers to volunteer for this training. Uh, essentially, they are instructed to speak in their na native language to each other, uh, but also to talk in code on top of that. So consider it essentially double encoded. The likelihood of any Japanese or German or Italian uh, being able to understand Navajo was close to zero. Because it was so incredibly effective, it was never broken as a code, the US military kept it classified until the 1970s in case they wanted to use it for future conflicts. And so it took a couple of decades before the contributions of the Navajo in particular were known to the public. Now, Navajo code talkers were mostly used in the Pacific. Each code talker was equipped with a radio and a bodyguard, with the understanding that if there was danger of a uh, code talker being captured by the Japanese, the bodyguard was instructed to kill the code talker so the code would not be compromised. So this was not a duty uh, that people signed up for lightly. Many Native Americans who did not enlist for military service did join other Americans in migrating to centers of war production and getting jobs uh, in industry. So what this ends up doing is this ends up shifting the population center for Native Americans away from reservation lands and spreading them out more in cities across the United States. For Native Americans, World War II ends up becoming a net positive because many Native American veterans are able to take advantage of the GI Bill and for the first time attain college education uh, and assistance uh, in things like mortgage applications and business loans for the first time. So this actually results in an economic boom for Native Americans after the war. World War II is decidedly more complicated for Asian Americans, particularly uh, for Japanese Americans, as we'll get to in a second. But for Chinese, Korean, and Filipino Americans, um, they were looked at with sympathy and friendship during World War II, in part because China, Korea, and the Philippines were all occupied by Japan. So, Chinese, Korean, and Filipino Americans were all seen as vital allies because their homeland was also under attack by the Japanese. For Japanese Americans, though, because Japan was our primary enemy in the Pacific, they were viewed with suspicion. And unlike German and Italian Americans, 
they could not easily just blend in to the population because of their racial difference. Because of this concern over uh, loyalty to the homeland of Japan, the U.S. government uh, issues an executive order and relocates all Japanese living on the West Coast in a particular zone inland. So the idea is, sorry, Sippy is determined to get her two cents in on this topic. So the idea behind this order is by removing Japanese Americans from the West Coast, this would make it so that the Japanese uh, military and Navy were deprived of any potential assistance in the event of an invasion of the West Coast, which again, given that the Japanese were occupying part of the Aleutian Islands during World War II, was not an unfound fear by the U.S. military. 70% of uh, Japanese Americans lived on the West Coast. So the vast majority of Japanese Americans found themselves being told that they had very little time to pack up their homes and businesses and be shipped uh, into the interior of the United States. They lived in internment camps uh, at places like Manzanar and Tool Lake. About 110,000 Japanese Americans are shipped to camps. And not all of these are Japanese immigrants or citizens. Many of them were born in the United States. So a lot of these second generation Japanese, what we call Nisei, um, were also shipped to the US, again, despite their status as citizens. And because of this, because two thirds of the detainees in these camps were citizens, there's a legal case that challenges uh, whether the United States can hold American citizens on the sole basis of their racial identity. So Fred Korematsu, one of these Nisei or first generation American uh, detainees, leads a court case called Korematsu versus the United States in 1944. The Supreme Court hears this case and in a six, third, six to three decision upholds the legality of this internment. It should be important to, to you to note that Korematsu versus the United States remains legal precedent until very, very recently. We're talking last year, kind of recently. So until the Supreme Court definitively overrules Korematsu versus the United States, um, this legal precedent that the United States could just round up people based on their identity based on race, ethnicity, potentially religion, kind of hung over uh, like a dark cloud. So again, it's only belatedly, as of 2019, uh, removed as legal precedent and finally overturned. Many of the Nisei, or the first generation American citizens living in these camp, uh, camps were given an option to enlist in the armed forces. About 20,000 young Japanese American men will enlist uh, from the camps. And another 13,000 Japanese American men will enlist from Hawaii. Now notice that the executive order removing Japanese Americans from the West Coast did not mention Hawaii. Part of the reason for this was Hawaii's relative isolation and the size of the Japanese American population in Hawaii. It was much larger uh, in proportion to the population there. There were a lot of people of mixed uh, descent and there was this concern that if you wholesale remove any person with Japanese ancestry and put them in camps in Hawaii, that you would pretty much tank the local economy. So in Hawaii, the only people put in internment camps were people who were strongly suspected or had some evidence against them that they were operating as enemy agents and remained loyal to the Japanese. So these Japanese American men who enlisted in the military served in segregated units with white commanders. The first of these units, the 100th, uh, was quickly joined by and combined with the 442nd. The 100th and the 442nd together 
are among the most decorated groups in the military during World War II, with most of the action for them being in the Italian campaign in 1943 and 44.